been doing HIV care since forever, and uh, I still enjoy doing HIV care. It's just great. We have new treatments. And when I was in Florida, in, in Palm Beach County, I used to work with the health department, and I have a long list of people, unfortunately, who died because we couldn't do too much for them. And uh, anyway, so those are sad memories. I wish they were now here because nobody died in this country with HIV as long as they are on treatment. Because we keep having more HIV infections. Uh, there is going to be a slide about that, especially Utah. So eventually somebody figured out that if we do some sort of pharmacological intervention, people might not get HIV when they are in a high risk situation. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. We know, uh, many of you know that using condoms prevent STD, HIV is an STD or STI, but the, the pharmacological intervention is much better than just uh, condoms. So let's just start with that. And I hope that when you, you know, at the end of this talk that you feel confident about prescribing Truvada or Descovy for HIV prevention because it's not really complicated, it's easy, uh, it's, it's much more easier than HIV therapy. So let's see, I am supposed to show this. <laughs> Because I, you know, we are funded by the federal government, HRSA, so anyway, and I think it's important. Let's just, okay. I don't have any conflicts. I don't do any research for any company. Uh, I just work in the clinic. Uh, so there is a plan by the federal government or HRSA to try to end this HIV epidemic, and the plan means a lot. Uh, obviously, if we can stop this from happening, stop people from getting HIV, that will be a great thing. Uh, and this is something easy to do. We don't have a vaccine. Uh, I think right now somewhere we are trying to stop an epidemic with vaccine, but there is a lot of people who refuse to do that. <laughs> Hopefully this will be easier than that thing. So we had about, you know, 75% reduction in new HIV infection in the next five years. This was said in 2020. And the government expect that by 2030, we will have 90% reduction in new HIV infection in this country. So that's your role in this plan is really, really important. So the plan that we have, we need to make diagnosis. Obviously, if we don't diagnose people with HIV, we don't know that they are infected, so you're going to be doing that. We are going to treat as soon as possible those people who turn out to have HIV infection. We are going to protect people who are at risk. This is what I'm going to talk a little bit. And I think like two, 2019, there was this epidemic in Indiana, in a small rural town, and they figure out that the whole community was doing drugs and sharing needles, and it was a mess. It was a lot of people diagnosed with hepatitis C and HIV. So when that kind of situation happened, the government wants to intervene as quickly as possible to stop the transmission as soon as possible. So your role will be here, the testing, and also the protect people that we feel, you feel, they are at high risk of getting HIV. So the goals, the objectives of this talk is identifying this patient at high risk of getting HIV and when to recommend PrEP, that is a pre-exposure prophylaxis. How to properly prescribe and monitor this medication following the DHHS guidelines. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this COVID, uh, that is uh, another medications that we had that have been approved. Uh, identify patients that might be candidate for PrEP, uh, I'm sorry, for candidate for HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, usually after sexual exposure, and review how PrEP might be implemented in your practice. This is our numbers, ours, Utah, in 2019. Those are the most recent ones that we had available, and this is through the State Health Department. So in 2019, when we had 134 new HIV diagnoses. We do have more people, like in our clinic, we have people moving from other states to Utah. They are considered new, but these are new HIV diagnoses, okay? 
Uh, also, I'm not going to talk about everything in the slide, but also you see that there is a high number of people that have been diagnosed with syphilis, uh, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, and that, you know all those things, they just come together. Uh, not too long ago, we have a patient that when he was diagnosed, a male patient, he had gonorrhea, he had chlamydia, he had syphilis, and also, unfortunately, he had HIV. Apparently, we feel that he got all of them during the same kind of encounter, okay? We had about uh, 2,600 people living with HIV in the state of Utah, and that number changed all the time. People who die, move away, people who come, new diagnosis. So we are expecting the 3,000 mark uh, maybe in the next year or two, it depends. Uh, you can decrease this number uh, I hope, uh, implementing pre pre uh, guidelines. And where is this county? What the, the Salt Lake County is the one that have more cases per 100,000 uh, population, but this is Davis County, isn't it? Waver, oh my God, don't, uh, sorry. <laughs> 2.6, so it is there. So, uh, I'm sorry, Salt Lake County 6.1, uh, Davis County 2.2 and Weaver 2.6. So you do have uh, Utah County 2.8. So you do have patients. So this is for you to open your eyes and realize we do have patients in this county that have HIV, which we just need to find them. Okay. And this is just to have an idea about HIV infection when what we call acute HIV infection. Uh, the why. Uh, uh, part uh, zero will be when I get exposed to that. And you can see that it had to be about 15 days uh, before you have HIV antibodies develop. So this is important to know about testing when you test people. But the HIV P24 is the first antigen from the HIV that comes, that is available out there. And even earlier, you had the HIV per se, the viral particle that is detectable in the blood. So the test that we had, and we will talk about that, the HIV antigen antibody testing, actually is as good as, as, as 15 days, two weeks, or maybe earlier than that. And it's important to know that limitation. So let's say that I have been infected with HIV, it have been five, five days or seven days, and you do one of these tests, and it's negative when you don't have HIV. So it's important to talk to people uh, because you might want to have the patient back again to repeat the test. So you can do an HIV PCR or viral law uh, just to see that. So the back long time ago, we are doing with this thing for 30 plus year, since 1981, 82. Uh, we have um, you know, different tests, uh, the Western blood, but again, we had now this HIV antigen antibody uh, test that is the best one that we have to detect HIV. But again, there is this uh, at the left, eclipse uh, period from zero to 10 is when the test is not going to detect HIV is, you know, is the person is infected. So after 10 days, then the test will help. So just keep that in mind that there is this period of time, a week, 10 days, that somebody with HIV, you're testing them during that time, and we don't know, obviously, so you might miss that. So then that's the important thing about talking to patients, asking them high risk behavior, symptoms of acute HIV, uh, so it's important to do that. Okay, any, if you have any question, please let me know. Okay, this is just pictures of people who, uh, with acute HIV, and uh, this is a rash that usually happen in the trunk, arms, face. Usually it's not all disseminated. In this case, he had a, the rash in the abdomen. It looks like a maculopapular rash, erythematous rash. The thing is that this can be what? Syphilis. It can be secondary syphilis, isn't it? Remember, anytime you see a patient that is sexually active, even if they are not, you need to think. Uh, and you see this kind of rash, and obviously lesion in the palms or the soles, all we think is this is syphilis. Oh no, this is psoriasis, this is a drug reaction, it could be. But you're going to be doing an RPR, uh, just don't miss that opportunity, and also an HIV testing. 
So these are the symptoms, the most common symptoms when people had acute HIV infection. It happened in about 80% of the patients, so that is about 20%. They don't have any symptoms. Fevers, fatigue, myalgia, skin rash, as we mentioned, headaches, pharyngitis, uh, and lymphadenopathy. It can be in the neck, in the groin area. So it's important not to forget that. And this looks like acute toxoplasmosis can be like this, EBV or mononucleosis. Uh, syphilis, sometimes maybe hepatitis, like hepatitis B can cause these symptoms. So there is a lot of diseases that look the same way, group A strep. Uh, so don't miss the opportunity. When we are talking or dealing with a young person, we all first also had sex, so you know, if I show up like that, you're going to say, Rosado, we're going to do an HIV and uh, So all people also had sex. But younger people have more sex, <laughs> and don't forget, if you encounter somebody in the emergency room in your clinic with these symptoms, you, you know, talk about that person. When was the last time you had sex, and that kind of thing. And we will talk more about that. This is a test, the HIV-1 and 2 antigen and antibody. So this is a great test. If the test is done and it's negative, that means there is no HIV. Or, remember, you are in that eclipse eclipse time or period from zero to 10. And depending on the interview that you have with the patient, you're going to decide, hey, Rosado, you might need to come back in three, three weeks or two weeks. Uh, again, uh, also during that time, you might want to test me for STIs. So you had different possibilities. Is the test, is the screening test is positive? They are going to make a di differentiation between HIV-1 and HIV-2. As you know, HIV-1 by far is the most common HIV strain in the whole world. HIV-2 is not that common, in this, especially in this country, but it's common in Western Africa. And we have people, we have in the clinic one or two people who are HIV-2, and that happen to be that they are actually from Western Africa. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, that's the reason that the government doesn't want to miss anything here. So we are having two. So screening positive, we are going to make a difference between HIV-1 and HIV-2. So you might get HIV-1 positive, HIV-2 negative. You can get the other way, HIV-2 positive, the other one negative. You can get both. Just recently I got a patient. Uh, actually, this person came from another state, and he never, he didn't want to be treated because he felt well, and that was about 10 years ago. And uh, when I repeat testing, happened that he had the two viruses. It's important that there is some medication for HIV-1, they do not work well for HIV-2. That's the only thing about that. And also HIV-2 is a more indolent disease. HIV-1, after seven years, the natural history, not treatment, eventually people start having symptoms. If you don't do anything, they will be dead between 10, 15 years. Most of the people, some people go faster, some people actually can live for a long, long time without any symptoms. So when you had a screening that is positive, but HIV-1 and 2 are negative or indeterminate, I'm sorry, indeterminate, then that's when you have problems. Or when they both are you know, screening positive, but 1 and 2 is negative or indeterminate, what you're going to do? Is that means this person had HIV infection, maybe he's in the he or she eclipse period, 0 to 10, and that's the reason it's like that. Uh, or is in the zero conversion phase, so that's what it, the, is in the term. So you're, the, the test is going to do a PCR, an HIV PCR. So we are going to be on nucleic acid amplification testing. So we are going to check for the virus, not the antibody response, but the virus. So is that the nucleic acid is positive, this person most likely is having a, acute HIV infection. But if it's negative, so definitely there is no HIV. Uh, here in the bloodstream. Uh, if you are dealing with a patient, if you ask me the question and I said, well, in the last month I have like four or five different sexual partners and I have multiple sexual encounters, I might say, oh, okay, so Rosado, you need to come back here in four weeks. Just, let's just be sure. Let's just test that you again. And also at the same time, you're going to be doing counseling. Hey, Rosado, are you wearing condoms every time you had sex? No. Okay, so let's just talk about that. And we are, you're going to be testing me for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and, uh, and counseling and all that. 
and hopefully I will listen to you. <laughs> we have people who don't just keep coming back with STIs. So prevention, so before, you know, for us as a medical provider, we want to see everybody healthy. And also we want to prevent people from getting diseases. So Rosado, you need to lose weight. Stop smoking. When you're drunk, don't drive. Don't hit your wife or your partner. There is so many, you know, don't eat so many fatty food, whatever. Decrease caloric intake. So we had now prep. We had some intervention and any intervention that Rosado, you're having too many sexual encounters. I'm just joking, you're not going to say that to Rosado. <laughs> just to make this a little more easy for you. So you, maybe you need to cut down bodies, you don't want to. We need to talk about condoms and about this thing called PrEP that is going to help you prevent getting HIV. I might be a sex worker. And I say, well, that's my job. I say, okay, well, then let's just make your job easier so you don't have to worry too much about this thing. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is an intervention. In, in this case, we are going to talk about a pharmacologic intervention. It's a medication that you take the way it is right now approved in this country is one pill every day to prevent you from getting HIV, okay? The main thing here, so we have that. We know that this work, if you take this pill every single day the way it's supposed to be, you're going to be more than 90%. I'm not going to say it's 100% because it's not, but more than 90%, 95% protection if I take this medication the way I'm supposed to. So, unfortunately, when we start doing this, this, this is from 2019, I think, uh, about, you know, 35%, up from 6% among MSM, men that have sex with men, they have the highest risk of getting HIV. But other people, too, and I will mention that. Uh, so, we feel that is the use of PrEP is too low in this country. Uh, and we, that's the reason I am here, to try to, for you to feel comfortable doing this intervention with your patients that you feel are, are at high risk, especially in uh, minority population like Hispanic uh, and, and African American MSN. So before you start, we're going to do that, maybe I can just tell, before you start, you well, talk to the patient, you need to be sure that the way you talk to our patients is not judgmental. Like, hey, Harry, are you gay? Or you a faggot? Or something like that. Eh, probably that's not a good idea, isn't it? You're going to say, Harry, that's my first name. Uh, are you, do you like to have sex with men, with women, with both? In a way that is like a casual conversation. And I, I feel like, oh, okay, so yeah, I, I like to have sex with men. So how many partners did you have in the last month, whatever time you want? I usually do two or three. When they are in prep, we ask for the last three months. And I say, well, I have like three or four, and maybe a new one or two one. And then are you using condoms? I say, no, I don't like condoms. The most common reason for that is it doesn't feel the same way. Just for you to know. So, okay, okay, and do you think about doing something? What about the possibility that you might get HIV because you're not using condoms? And also I say, well, I prefer to be the bottom. You know what I mean, the top and the bottom. Top is insertive, bottom is resected. So, and talking about anal sex. And I say, no, I am bottom. So, and this partner, my partner doesn't use condoms. So that's a very high risk for me uh, for getting HIV. So. So I am the perfect candidate to get PrEP, but the conversation is going to be as pleasant as possible. I have a patient that one time told me that he's in PrEP, that in the last three months he has 30 different partners. So I was inside like, okay. And then I said, okay, so let's just keep moving. <laughs> and so I don't know, he was trying to kind of shock me or something like that, but I, I said, no, don't say anything. Just keep moving on. Anything. So I don't know. Uh, he does. He he followed with another doctor. Not because I told him I'm not taking care of you, but he he that is he changed his insurance change. So again, we don't have enough healthcare providers like yourself. Uh, we like to recruit some people here. I have a list. A, a, a little thing you're going to sign. Just kidding. 
So yeah, I'm going to do PrEP, Dr. Rosado. Remember, one, on, one in three primary care doctors and nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, they haven't heard about PrEP. So in this country, that, that's a shame, I think. I mean, if I'm living in Latin America, I am from Puerto Rico, I can see that, but not in this country. We are inundated with Facebook, Twitter, TV. Sometimes we hear bad news all the time and not important news like this one. So remember that condom use prevent about 80%, and sorry, not only HIV, but STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis. This is not related to this talk. Remember, I can get syphilis with oral sex. So oral sex doesn't mean, oh, well, you're safe. People can get syphilis, so please try to test people who had oral sex uh, for syphilis too. I can get gonorrhea in my throat and chlamydia. With PrEP, about HIV prevention, about 92%, again, 80% 80 with condoms. Remember that resective anal sex is the highest risk of getting HIV and any other STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Resective vaginal sex is followed by that, but you can see now we are in the less than 1% chances. Insertive anal sex and insertive vaginal sex. So factors that can increase the chances of getting HIV when we practice unprotected sex. If, if I have HIV, but I am not taking medication, my HIV viral load is really high. It's easier for me to spread that to my partner. If I am having, or the partner is having an STI, and the main thing about STI is that um, there is inflammation of the mucosa that facilitate the HIV to go through the mucosa and cause infection. Uh, any, anything in the mucosa, that doesn't, doesn't have to be gonorrhea, chlamydia, trachomonas can do that, other thing. Uh, if there is like a tearing or abrasion because of the se sex act, also that can cause breaks in the mucosa and menstruation to, I'm sorry, is another uh, factor for that. Now fact is, let's say that I have HIV but I am on medication and the doctor has said, you know, your HIV is undetectable or less than 30, then I am most likely not going to prevent HIV. But if I meet somebody and that person say, hey, I got HIV, but I am taking medication, I am undetectable, like, I'm not going to say, show me the viral law. Do you have documentation of that? We like documentation, isn't it? I like to see it in a documentation. No documentation, we are going to use condom. Uh, if I get exposed to HIV, if I go to the doctor in less than 72 hours, I can have post-exposure prophylaxis. Circumcision is something that has been proved mainly in Africa, I work here, uh, to decrease the chances of getting HIV, but this medical intervention works better for heterosexual couples, not for the MS and not for men that had sex with men. Lubrication decreased tearing and abrasions and ulcerations in the, you know, in the genital mucosa, so that helped. Uh, as you can see, for HIV, oral sex is very, very low. To the point that is people come and tell me I had oral sex, somebody ejaculated in my mouth. We are now probably going to uh, prescribe PrEP or post-exposure prophylaxis unless the person had gingival disease, inflammation, ulceration, then that's another story. So you have to look at the mouth. Okay, of all the intervention, these are a lot of studies that we are not going to be talking about, but condoms is there, and the last one that is the, the most effective one is the PrEP, uh, if you take it as prescribed. So who is a good candidate for uh, PrEP? I'm going to tell you, bef with, before we talk about this, anybody, anybody who comes to your office and say, hey, Rosario, I want PrEP. And sometimes people don't tell you, especially about sex, or well, I had like a hundred sexual partners in the last day, or things like that. They don't want to tell you that, because they look at you, what well, she or he looks like. If I say something like that, I might not be able to come back here. So it's important, if somebody come to you and say that, then probably do the prep. Then ask the question, is that shoot first and ask the question later. I think that's the way they used to do in the old West. But anyway, so if I identify as an MSN, but I never had sex, 
well, there is no point to do that. And, but if the patient says, I really want to have PrEP, I say, okay, we are going to do PrEP, okay? If, uh, if I have a HIV-positive partner and the partner doesn't want to uh, use condoms, even if the partner is undetectable, we don't know anything about the partner. That's what the patient is telling me. I would most likely recommend that. If I ask to the, the, the person, hey, uh, let's say in the last three months or six months, had you ever been diagnosed with syphilis, gonorrhea? Oh, yeah. That's another clue that this person needs spread. Uh, every time you had sex, do you use condoms or not? Nah, I don't. So, okay, so just keep that, putting a little points in that. And uh, if I am a commercial sex worker, so definitely. So that's, that's the thing that you had to ask. But this is not the only thing that you need to take in consideration. Again, if I come to you, I am an MSN, and I said, you know, I really like PrEP. I, I, I want to, I have friends doing that. I am going to be more like, okay, so maybe there is something here. Try not to get information, or if the patient might not want to share some information, that's fine. And we are going to do that, okay? Now, so, so you're seeing me, and then you decide, we decide, because it's, it's between the patient and the provider, that it's okay to start PrEP. So what I'm going to do? Okay, Rosado. So we are going to do a battery of tests, and every three months or six months, it depends. Uh, we like to keep patients uh, coming to the clinic every three months. We are going to do this test, HIV serology. Remember, we are going to do the antigen and antibody test always, every three months. We are going to test this person in PrEP for gonorrhea, chlamydia, the nucleic acid amplification test. You don't need to do cultures or nothing like that. And we are going to do three sites, the throat, the urine, and the rectum. And we are going to tell the patient that. But if the patient say, I don't have anal sex, okay. Uh, I, the other, not too long ago, somebody said, well, I mean, the only thing you need is the urine because if I, had gonor if, if I have there, that means I have uh, gonorrhea in the, in the urethra, so I have there in my throat and my rectal. So sometimes you have to talk to the patient about, nope, that's not the case. And the other thing is we have, we see in the prep clinic a lot of people with gonorrhea and chlamydia in the rectal area, in the urine and the throat, and they do not have any symptoms. They are asymptomatic. The problem with that is that asymptomatic disease, I can pass that to somebody else even if I don't have any symptoms. So we need to do that, okay? It's really, really important. The RPR uh, for, to rule out syphilis. Uh, I have a talk for syphilis. I wish we can talk about that. Uh, because it's just a fascinating disease. Remember, it's RPR. If somebody has syphilis in the past, remember that the specific syphilis test do not need to be re doesn't need to be repeated. Just the RPR or BDRL. I think most of you do RPRs, isn't it? No BDRL. So that's the one that you need for people that had a history of. If I never had history of syphilis, the RPR is positive. There is an order RPR reflex too, so you can order that one. But again, if I had syphilis, my specific syphilis test would always be positive until I die. So uh, the other test that we need to do is it's a female and she can have babies. We are going to do a pregnancy test. This is really, really important, okay? So we are, do we are doing also hepatitis B serology. We are going to do the antibody and the antigen and the core antibody. Really important, there is a panel that sometimes people do in the emergency room called the acute hepatitis serology. It doesn't, is that not the one that you want? You want to know if the person had acute hepatitis C or positive IgG, if the person is immune, or had antibody positive, and I think it's more than 10, at least in the test that we do. I think depending on the test, it might be another uh, range. And the core antibody, so sometimes you can have a core antibody positive, but the antibody, the surface antibody is negative. What to do with that? Uh, if you had an antigen positive, by definition, the person had chronic hepatitis B. And why that is important to do? Well, through VADA or the SCOBY, the two medications that we have right now, we have right now to treat, uh, to prevent HIV, also treat hepatitis B. So you need to keep that, you know, in your mind when you do that. 
If the person is a hepatitis B surface antibody positive, immune, fine, you don't need to do that anymore. If the person doesn't have chronic hepatitis B but is not immune, you are going to do the hepatitis B vaccine. And are you aware of the Heplizab? Heplizab. That's a new hepatitis B vaccine. We just need two shots. Instead of the old one, that you need three shots. The Heplizab 2, one is a month or two months for the second? One month. So, and then you can actually, if you do it now, you're going to see the person in three months. You can do it in three months. But it's more effective and it's only two shots. And the completion rate is much better than the pe people who had to take the three, the old one. So don't use the old one anymore. The hepatitis C testing is important. There is more evidence that usually you, you know, hepatitis C, is, are you a drug user? But actually in the MSM population, there is more and more evidence that people can get hepatitis C through sexual encounter, usually anal sex. So it's important to do that at least once a year, the hepatitis C, okay? And obviously, they turn out to be positive. You are going to do, we are going to do the screening. If the screening is positive, we are going to do a hepatitis C PCR, just to be sure. Remember, just a little tip. I had hepatitis C. You treat me. I am cured. The hepatitis C serology or screening test would always be positive after treatment. The only way for you to figure out if I have it again is to do the PCR. Because I have new infection, the PCR is going to be high. Okay, so we had uh, uh, the tenofovir DF TAF and the entristitabine that are in Truvada also work for hepatitis B, so you have to be uh, you know, aware of that fact. So let's say that I had hepatitis B, you diagnosed me and say, oh, Harry, don't worry, we are going to do Truvada, I will take care of that. So is that the story is there? Like we are done? No. So you had to tell me, Harry, if, because you had hepatitis B, Truvada, or this COVID is going to help you with that, uh, you might want to refer me to the gastroenterology, or if you want to follow my hepatitis B, you're going to tell me, hey, you just cannot stop Truvada whenever you want. The thing is, I am hepatitis B, Truvada, or this COVID, I am suppressed, I stop all the sudden, I'm going to have a flare-up. And sometimes people can end in the hospital with acute hepatitis B, acute inflammation, no, acute hepatitis B, inflammation of the liver, and there have been some cases of fulminant hepatitis. So it's important that you don't forget to do that. Okay, uh, let's just move on. The renal function is important because the two medications, Truvada and Descovi, can decrease renal function. So for Descovi, is less. They had less renal toxicity, so you had to have a baseline chemistry uh, for, you know, to calculate creatinine clearance. So if you're going to do Truvada, Truvada is generic now, so it's very inexpensive compared to the SCOVID. If you're going to do Truvada, uh, just be you know, sure that the estimated uh, creatinine clearance is, it, it, it had to be more than 60. Is this less than 60? Do not use Truvada, it's going to make it worse. Now, if you had a person that is diabetic, hypertensive, already have mild underlying kidney disease, probably do not start Truvada, just go to the SCOVI. Uh, so for the SCOVI, so is this less than 60 but higher than 30, the SCOVI is, uh, is the other option uh, in that case. Uh, this, you can use that Cockcroft goal, creatinine clearance calculation is more specific, not a specific or sensitive for renal dysfunction than just the usual uh, calculated creatinine clearance that you get in your blood test. So remember, every three months we are going to do, do HIV testing. It's really important. You're going to ask the patient, okay, Harry, how many times did you forget to take your Truvada? Well, I just take it. I just take it when I have sex. That's not good. So obviously that means that I, I am not fully protected if I do that kind of thing, okay? And also you're going to ask me any fever, any chills, any muscle aches, joint aches, skin rash, ulcers in your mouth, headaches, because those are symptoms that can be associated with acute hepatitis, uh, acute HIV infection. Remember for females that can become pregnant, a pregnancy test, do prescription only for three months. 
don't do more than that. The thing is that if you do more than three months, they might disappear. You don't know. They might be taken through bad up well. They might, have, they might be developing chronic kidney, I mean, acute kidney damage, and they don't feel anything. So you need to you know, check that with blood tests. So only three months, and if they call and they want refilled, you're going to say, well, you need to come. We need to do an HIV testing and all that before I can prescribe you more. Uh, you talk to them about possible side effects, uh, and adherence is really important, as I said. And also keep talking if the person refused to use condom. Every time they come and say, what about condoms? Say no, just document that the patient refused that, but that means that you talk to them about condoms, okay? If they have other, in the clinic, we follow the PrEP clinic that we have, we only deal with PrEP. If they had a hypertension, other stuff, we tell them you need to go to your primary care provider. If you are a primary care provider, you can take, obviously you are already taking care of all that, so it shouldn't be a problem. So, Let's see. Nausea, flatulence, and headaches are the most common side effects of this Truvada medication, clinical side effects, I should say. But there is also bone and renal toxicity, especially Truvada. Truvada is more associated with osteopenia, osteoporosis, uh, than the SCOVI. Okay? So that's the reason to have a baseline creatinine clearance. If a person that already had renal problems, I say, well, maybe I shouldn't use Truvada. Uh, but, you know, just for you to know. Now, the whole thing about bone toxicity in the, because we can use Truvada and the SCOVI to treat HIV, those one, either and something else, but uh, in the HIV population, we figure out, some people figure out that that bone density or osteopenia happen in the first year, kind of drop, but then after a year, it gets stable and you don't have more drop. Some people might say it might be more particularly important in older people like me and all four that maybe I have weak bones already. So you need to talk to me about that. There is no indication right now to do a DEXA scan at baseline. You know, unless the person is 50, older, chronic smoker, diabetic, and they had the risk factor for osteoporosis, you might want to do that anyway. So that might be a good thing to have. So, uh, so it's important. And the kidney, it's, that's the reason you need to do this test every three months, just to be sure. As you see that things are not going well, so it might be a good idea just to switch if the person is taking Truvada to the SCOBY and calculate the creatinine clearance. There have been some cases of people taking Truvada that came down with HIV infection. They are very uncommon. As far as we know, it's very effective preventing HIV. It's, it's the best thing that we have right now to prevent HIV. There is nothing else. But something will come soon. So remember, if you are treating a patient and happen that the patient are taking other medication that can cause uh, kidney dysfunction, be aware of that, uh, because that might be a problem. Le Lepipasvir and sofosfruit. Sof so fosbuvir, can say that. So hepatitis C treatment drugs. Uh, if a person is taking a lot of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, then you have to be careful. You have to tell the patient, advise the patient about that. And remember, creatine supplement. A lot of people do creatine supplement to develop muscles like me. So it looks really good. And that actually, you mix that with Truvada or the SCOBY, that will cause more problems with the kidney. So always ask that question. The question about, are you taking any supplement? Are you taking any herbal thing? Oh, yeah, I'm taking this from the internet and something that came from a, a region that nobody knows in Africa. It's great. So, so do you know, those unregulated things, they can have toxins, lead, mercury, and these and people don't know about that. that Nobody check those things. So I, usually we tell the patient, not usually, all the time, stop taking that thing. It's just going to cause problems with your liver or, or your kidney. And tricitamine, that is the other component of Truvada uh, and the SCOBY, it really doesn't have too much uh, side effects or problems. Uh, so anyway, so remember the Truvada, about 80, 90% effective when you take it all the time. Uh, failures when you are, you know, adherence to therapy are very, can happen, but they are very, very rare. Side effects are mild. When we're talking about flatulence, we tell the patient you might have flatulence more than the usual thing, so, but, you know, 
I better have flatulence than HIV. A screen for HIV before you start. And let's say that I call you and say, hey, I want PrEP, and then I am seeing you in your clinic, and I say, well, I have an HIV test two weeks ago. It was negative. Do an HIV test. We usually don't start PrEP right away, although there is some places in the country doing that. I mean, if you can do a rapid HIV testing, it's available. We don't have that in the clinic, uh, and it's negative, okay? Uh, but usually we, we see the patient, we do the test in the clinic, and usually they, our HIV test come back the next day. Negative, but we call the patient, okay, we are going to call the pharmacy right now with the, you know, Truvada. That is not a big deal. And meanwhile, use condom. Uh, but one or two days is not a big deal to wait to start getting Truvada, okay? Uh, so people who continue to have high-risk behavior uh, for STI uh, and... And there was a study before, when PrEP was uh, approved, there was this big thing that, oh well, PrEP, because people are going to take PrEP, they are going to be more conscious about this. They might use more condoms. And turn out the other way. We are seeing more gonorrhea, more chlamydia, and more syphilis in these people who are taking PrEP. That's, that's the way it is. So those testing every three months are really, really important. And I said earlier, asymptomatic disease for chlamydia and gonorrhea are frequent. Oh, I feel good. We are going to do the test anyway. Uh, because if I had that and I don't have any symptoms and I keep practicing unsafe sexual encounter, I'm going to spread that to my partner. Uh, let's see. This is, uh, let's just keep this one. This is spread failures I mentioned to you. Okay. Uh, so again, adherence, ef efficacy by blood tests. And many of these studies, some studies shows PrEP is great, Truvada is great, uh, and others didn't show so much. But then they say, well, let's just go back to this study and, and check the blood samples of the people who were on PrEP and find out if they had the drug in the blood. And voila, the people who had blood, detectable concentration of the drug in the plasma or the blood, they were more protected, more than 90%, compared that people who didn't have any blood, uh, any drug in their blood. So, you know, they have a lot of evidence about this. So, again, adherence is important. If you are adherence, you're going to have close to 90%. These are different studies for PrEP done, partners on PrEP, the TDF2, and the IPREX. And you can see all of them shows that. It is important to, we are talking here about sexual exposure to HIV. IV drug users can benefit from PrEP. The efficacy is not as good. Usually it's about in the 70, 75% protection, but that's better than no protection at all. So somebody, we hardly, I don't remember having any patient that, it, that is an IV drug user in the PrEP clinic. Unfortunately, they don't come. Uh, there is a concern about compliance, too, because of the whole drug use and that kind of thing. But also health. There was a, a study a long time ago done in, in, in the Far East, uh, and I think in Thailand, that shows protection, too, for IV drug users. Just keep this one. There is the failures that I'm talking about. You can look at these slides. Okay. So, again, when taking all the time, uh, there is uh, PrEP is more than 90% effective. Uh, so remember, so, and this is important to, to, to know. So, okay, here we are going to start PrEP. Your HIV is negative. Here, go to the pharmacy, take it. So, and I have people asking me, so when can I start having unprotected sex again? And then never, but you need to use condom. But the thing is this, so for males, uh, especially MSN that had anal sex, it takes seven days to have protective levels in the rectal mucosa. So it's important to, to do that. After seven days, you will be protected, but keep using condoms. For females uh, in, the, uh, in the vagina, uh, vagina mucosa, up to 21 days, so uh, three weeks, 21 days. So you, you need to tell them that. It's important that they know that. Protection in females in 21 days, in males, that had uh, anal sex a week or seven days, okay? Uh, if people have problem with that, they say, oh, I need to have sex with that. So, okay, use condoms. 
You know, we don't have to have sex every day. So just for you to know. So remember, if you are going to stop prep, I come to you and say, hey, I just, I have a partner. It's stable. I trust this person. This person isn't going to be around having sex with other people without me knowing. And uh, so we are going to continue the prep. And then you're going to do it 28. You're going to say, okay, Harry, the last time you had sex, yesterday. Okay, let's just keep doing this for the next 28 days and try not to have any sex. And then we stop. And that's it. But don't stop right away in this, in that visit, unless in that visit, I say, when was the last time you had sex, Harry? Oh, two months ago. Okay, so we can stop today. Just in case there have been a recent exposure, so I will have protection before I stop that. Okay? We have people that stop PrEP, and the next thing they're calling, uh, oh, I have a, an exposure. So we need to do post-exposure prophylaxis and talk to them to see if we can then transition from that to PrEP again. Okay? And we have people, that's the funny thing, that after all talking to them and seeing them for a long time, they are in PrEP, they have a high-risk encounter, and they call me because they want medication to prevent HIV. But they are taking through butter. I said, well, okay, I guess I, maybe they didn't understand me. So remember about adverse events, barriers to adherence, to find out why I am not being adherence, why I'm missing doses, uh, how can I help you, Harry, to, so you don't forget. Maybe I can give you a pill box. Maybe you can put that in your wash, you know, electronic wash. Now they have these alarms all the time. So it's really important, and, and every time you talk to them, remember this doesn't work if you don't take it. So, you know, that's, that's really important. Uh, and then remember to, oh yeah, I take it all the time. It's like, no, don't bother me, anymore. I take it all the time. So you might get a sense that I am not telling you the truth. But again, you just talk to me and say, hey, hey, sorry, but it's really important. You don't want to get HIV. Remember Truvada is now generic. Uh, it's about, I was told, $40, $45 a month. And guess how much is the other one? Anybody want to ask? Doscovy, that is the other one. 17, something like that, 15. Now, I didn't mention too much, but anyway, the Scovy, that is like a, like a second generation version of Truvada, the most important thing is they create the renal toxicity is very low, it still can cause it, but compared to Truvada, it's much better, and bone toxicity. So a lot of people will prefer to take the Scovy. Also, if you had this patient that I mentioned with mild renal dysfunction, elderly, multiple comorbidities, hypertension, all that, you might want to use the SCOVI to minimize the chances of those things from happening. Okay, so let's see. And I have a slide. Oh. Well, okay, so I, I had a slide that compared to Vara and the SCOBY. I think the most important thing with the SCOBY, low bone toxicity, low kidney toxicity compared to Truvada, uh, and uh, again, had to be taken every single day. Also, the, the pill size is a little smaller than the Truvada size. The problem is the, the price. The SCOBY is not generic. It's about $1,500, $1,600 a month. All the insurance will pay for that. Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare will pay for that, private insurance, as long as you document that this is for prevention. That, if the insurance definitely want that. They don't want to treat somebody with HIV. That costs a lot more money than just helping the patient prevent getting HIV. So now we have these pills. Now what is next? Just recently, this week actually, it's kind of coincidental that I am talking about that. Uh, is it Gilead? Huh? Viv. Viv is a company, is a company that had this medication called cabotegravir. Cabotegravir is a new medication to treat HIV. So we are combining with cabotegravir with something else to treat HIV. But also they did a huge study about using cabotegravir only to prevent HIV. And guess what? And the whole thing is, uh, and I think it's going to be the same thing for a prevention that you need, is, is, there is a pill for cabotegravir that you start that, and the reason, the, the shot can stay in your body for two months. 
So the reason to start this, the pills first, the cabotegravir pills, is you just, let's say you, you put that injection there and all of a sudden I have an anaphylactic reaction. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot open my butt and take it out, isn't it? But if I take a pill and then you take care of me and it just goes away, the pill is different because it had to be taken every day, so it doesn't last that long. So, you can, so that's the thing, start with pill for a month, if everything is fine, the patient is tolerating that, no side effects, then we are going to transition to the shot, and the shot is once every two months. And guess what, the study shows that, any surprises, cabotegravir, and it's only that, right now Truvada and Descovi had two medications, cabotegravir is only one is more effective than Truvada or Descovi. More good news, and before I tell you the bad ones, it doesn't cause any bone toxicity or any kidney toxicity. The bad news is it's going to be a tons of money <laughs> to get the thing. Uh, it's an injection. Usually the most frequent side effects during the clinical side effects during the trials was pain in your butt. Uh, and, but nobody discontinued the injection because of that. It, besides that, Christine, any other big, major, important side effect? So that is coming. The company already sent to the FDA the results of the clinical trials. It looks really good, and it's just a matter of when, because the FDA is dealing now with so many medications to manage COVID infection. We, it, it might be a little delay before we get that. So. This is uh, HIV infections when you were using intramuscular cabotegravir, 13, compared to the other group when they did this study, the, the tenofovir uh, Truvada. Just to, so they had 39 infections the, in the group taking Truvada, but only 13. So you can see uh, in that clinical trial how effective this you know, thing. One of the good things about injection is, you know, you get it, so I don't have to take pills every single day. Maybe, you know, for people who don't like to take pills every day. They, you might say, okay, so it's not like, you know, going to Disneyland. You still need to come every two months to get that shot. If you don't come on time, the levels in the blood will drop, and then the door is open to get HIV if you get in that position. So be ready to, in your clinic, if, if you want to start doing this, uh, uh, and the shot should be given in the clinic. There is a certain way that you have to put that shot. It's not that a regular by ceiling shot, or you know, it had to be done like in the lateral hip area. It, it's just a complicated thing. So it cannot be given, it should not be given in the pharmacy, but just in your clinic, and you should have somebody that can master the technique to do that. But it's great. But, and also when, so you had to have a, I don't know, some sort of memory thing, Hell, hey, Harry, uh, hey, Dr. Robinson, Harry's supposed to come next week. Uh, so somebody can call me and say, Harry, just get your butt here, so you're going to get another shot. In the HIV, for the HIV, we are supposed, you can do it a week before or a week after that day that you're supposed to get the shot. So you had that window of opportunity to get me back. It's really important. Uh, so anyway, for HIV, it's more important because if I am HIV and I'm getting this with the other medication, if I develop subtherapeutic levels and then the HIV can become resistant to gabotegravir and then I, I have to go back to the pills, okay? So anyway, this is in cisgender woman, the same thing. Uh, cabotegravir, only four develop acute HIV compared to 34 in the Truvada group. So this is MSM uh, and transgender woman. So men, you know, transitioning to be female, the same thing. Look at that. Uh, this is HIV incident rate for 100 person a year. It's just everywhere, everywhere you look at this data is really, really good. Uh, cabotegravir compared to Truvada. Okay, so for you to know, if you had any patient that do not have any insurance, but you feel the person will benefit from getting PrEP, we do have a free PrEP clinic at the university hospital, it's free. The only thing obviously they had to prove that they don't have any way to pay for that. The visit is free, the medication is free, uh, testing, the, everything is free. 
And we have quite a number of people already, you know, taking advantage of that. So somebody that you see, that you feel, you know, you, you should get PrEP, but they don't have any insurance or any way to pay for that, just refer them to our clinic. And I think there is a Gilead talking about Truvada and the SCOVI. So now Truvada is generic. It's only $45 a month. But the SCOVI, you need to use the SCOVI. I think Gilead has like a help people uh, pay for the medication. Uh, it, it, there is a process. You need to apply. Somebody had to send the application. They had to prove that they cannot pay for that. And sometimes you can get it for free if the patient qualifies. So there is that. And also there is the free PrEP clinic that we have, and we take any people, so as long as they're living in Utah. So you can send it our way, and, and there is some information there. So remember, that's it. But for post-exposure, I still have time, or I am? How much? Four minutes. Remember post-exposure. I didn't put any slide here. So I got exposed to HIV, I think. So I go on to see you, you're going to tell me what kind of, what you think that, and I say, well, I had sex with this guy, condoms were not used, I was the bottom, he was the top, I don't have any idea who is this guy, <laughs> and I just met him in the internet. It, 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 believe it or not, that's a really, you know, you see that in the news, it's true when I, when I talk to people, they say that, and, and I thought, so you went to see somebody that you really don't know, you think you know because you chat with that person in the internet, and you all of a sudden are in a room alone with this person, and it, it usually happens with the rape cases. We see rape cases in the clinic for post-exposure prophylaxis. They had to go first to the emergency room to have like a forensic evaluation. It's just sad uh, to, to see that kind of thing happen. But anyway, so, or just have a friend, and, and then the friend tell me, Oh, well, after the sexual encounter, well, I have HIV, I am treatment, but then I am like, I don't know what to do. Or I have HIV, I don't have anything. Or people don't say that, isn't it? Like, oh, by the way, before we had sex, I have HIV, so let's just have sex because, you know, people will go away, run away from you. I have people in the clinic telling me that, like, they hate to tell their partners uh, and I, you know, we had a little talk about that. Anyway, so if that happened and I need post-exposure prophylaxis, it had to happen before 72 hours or three days. After 72 hours, it's too late for this medication to work. Uh, there is, uh, the CDC recommend some medication, including Truvada, uh, is in that, plus something else. Uh, usually we had Icentres or Rantegravir, that is an integrase inhibitor, had to be given twice a day, Truvada once a day. The other one, I sent us twice a day for 28 days only. The other combination is Truvada and Dolutegravir. That is another integrase inhibitor. Again, Cabotegravir is an integrase inhibitor. They are really great medication for 28 days. Perfect adherence. You don't want them to miss any doses. You emphasize that when you see them and then follow them in two weeks or four weeks. I usually do four weeks at the end. Before you do that, you, they are supposed to have an HIV testing. I was, let's say, I had this encounter last night. Uh, how can I have HIV now? No, just to be sure that I don't have HIV already, because that can happen. And maybe I have HIV, I don't know it, but you need to know that. And uh, if that is the case, then I'm already on therapy, and then the whole thing is going to change. You know, hey, Harry, come back here. We need to talk about other stuff and that kind of thing. So remember, HIV at baseline, at 28 days or 30 days after I finish my post-exposure prophylaxis, and then in three months will be the last HIV testing that you do. If it's negative, that means I didn't get. We haven't had any uh, people converting because of a, uh, they took post-exposure prophylaxis, a high-risk encounter, we haven't. But also, I have to say, we have some people that didn't return to the file for the follow-up visit. So hopefully, they're going to be okay. So prep is really easy to do. Uh, you know, you just need to start doing it, and you realize that it's not a big thing. It's it's not scary. And remember that there is some things that you have to tell the patient. You have to come. You had to tell me you had a problem, something like that. 
and, and also it will be your contribution to try to decrease this epidemic and hopefully in the future we can eliminate this thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>